Well, all right, good morning, DCC. It's so good to see you guys here again, whether you're here in the room or you're watching on live stream. I uh, hope your holiday is going to go well this week with Thanksgiving coming up, and it's just so good to see you here with us. Today we're in week four of a series we're going through in the book of Daniel, and it's a series we're calling Standing Strong in a Hostile World. A couple of weeks ago, we kicked off this series, and we did it by acknowledging that there's a very real dilemma that a lot of us face in our lives, and that dilemma is this. Hey, how do you stand firm in your faith without compromising to the culture around you or losing influence with the people that Jesus wants you to reach in your life? Now, here's just a reality. It's not meant as an attack. We live in a world that is increasingly hostile towards the things of God. And a lot of times, Christians, followers of Jesus, feel like they have to pick one of those two options. And so for some of you, you're here today, and it is all about standing firm. Hey, I am going to see this hostile world and let them know exactly what I think about it, okay? I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to be blunt. I'm going to be brash. I'm going to share the truth and even ram the truth down your throat if I need to, right? And the thing about people like that is oftentimes you're right. I mean, nobody likes you, but you're right, you know? Uh, and what we're really missing in those moments is we do a great job of standing firm, but we really miss out on having influence and loving people really well. Some of you aren't there, though. Some of you may err more on the side of compromise. And so you see a culture that's hostile to God, and you're tempted to say, well, we just need to love people, right? Uh, I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm just going to be tolerant of everybody, well, hey, that's just the way they are. They're never going to change. It's okay. And look, while in ex to an extent we need to meet people where they are and love people where they're at, that's what Jesus does for us, what happens if we stand on a place of compromise is we miss out on standing firm and we never share what people need most in that moment, which is the truth of God's Word. Oftentimes we want to pick between the two. What God wants you and me to do is to have balance and do both to be a people that stand firm in our faith, but also have influence and reach the people who are around us. And that's exactly why the book of Daniel is so helpful for us. See, Daniel was a guy who lived a really long time ago in the Bible. And early in his life, we see that his hometown of Jerusalem was captured by an evil, wicked, pagan, anti-God culture named Babylon. This culture came in and destroyed his city, uh, they killed a lot of people, they stole a lot of their stuff, and then they brought them back to their culture to indoctrinate them so they would become like their culture. And in the midst of what's going on, in the midst of his world being turned upside down, Daniel was a guy who stood firm on who God wanted him to be, but he also had influence in his life, which is what God wants for you and for me. In week one, we saw a dilemma that Daniel faced in his life, and so when he got back to Babylon, what they would normally do is they would change your name. They would try to change who you were, what you believed, and who you followed. And because Daniel was secure in his identity, he knew who God made him to be, and he knew how God called him to live. He was able to stand firm, but also gain influence. Week two, we saw a dilemma that Daniel didn't experience, but a guy named Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, experienced in his life. Nebuchadnezzar has this crazy dream. Nobody around him in his circle of influence can tell him what it means. And so he decides he's just going to kill everyone in his circle of influence and get a new circle of people. How many of you would have loved to have had that job and hear that news, right? It wasn't a good situation. And when Daniel got this news, what he did was he prayed hard. He realized that he had done all that he could do so he was inviting God into the process to do all that he could do. God showed up in an amazing way and revealed the dream to him. He shared it with Nebuchadnezzar, and when he did it, he gave God the credit. And so his influence grew, and he was also able to stand firm very, very well. Last week, we didn't see a dilemma with Daniel or Nebuchadnezzar, but we saw a dilemma with Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe you've heard this story before. So Nebuchadnezzar builds this large 90-foot statue. I mean, talk about compensating for something, okay? And he commands that everyone in the kingdom would bow down and worship that statue when they heard the music play. And in that moment, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, listen, they had courageous faith. 
in that moment, they resolved to not bow down and worship culture, but to bow down and to worship God. And that even if they lost their life, even if it didn't play out the way they thought it would for their safety, man, it was worth it. And something amazing happened. We see that because they stood for God, God stood with them in that moment, and He rescued them from the punishment that was coming their way. Today, though, uh, we're actually going to go back to the life of Daniel in Daniel chapter 4. And we're going to see that he's faced with another dilemma that some of you may have had in your life before. And the dilemma was this. See if you've had it. Hey, how do I confront someone in a loving way? Come on now. How many of you have been there before? You have struggled with that. How do I confront someone? How do I have the hard conversation with someone in a way that is loving and in a way that helps them, not hurts them, and builds influence with them? The worship team laughed at me when I said that's the dilemma we were going to be talking about today. So like, I don't know what that means for you, but apparently they thought it was funny. How do you confront someone in a loving way? Because here's the thing, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, okay, wherever you're at in your faith journey today, there's going to be conflict that you face in your life. There's going to be conflict that you face in your relationships, How do you navigate that conflict in a way that loves people, not hurts people? And so for some of you in the room or watching online, man, you're a parent. And your kid uh, is making some really bad decisions in their life, right? Like, our, our kids are perfect. Our kids would never do anything that's wrong. They always listen to me and do what I tell them to do, right? But you see your kids making some mistakes, and it's that tension as a parent of, hey, How do I step in and address this situation and help them, but not bring harm to them or them feel like I'm coming at them in their life? How do you navigate conflict while loving well? Maybe it's not that, but maybe it's a family member of yours who's making some very poor financial decisions. It's like you see a train wreck fixing to happen on the horizon and there's nothing you can do about it, okay? How do you step in and initiate conflict in a way that helps them while also loving them very well in their lives. Maybe it's not that, but look, Thanksgiving's coming up, right? It's this Thursday. How many of you have that relative that just gets on everybody's nerves? Okay, let me see your hand. Man, they're always coming after people. They're always annoying people. They're always bringing people down. If your hand is not raised, you may be that person. Okay, like I'm just here to burst your bubble today. I'm just kidding. But look, how do you navigate that? And how do you have that tough conversation in a way that addresses the problem and helps the person, not tears the person down and the person feels like you're coming at them? And today, what we're going to see in Daniel chapter 4 is just that. There's a conflict that he is going to have to engage in with someone. But the way he does it and the way he has that conversation is going to be helpful for us as we seek to stand firm while also growing our influence with other people. And so this is Daniel chapter 4. I'll start in verse 4 and then work down to verse 9 just to set the stage for what's going on today. So here's what's going on. If you were here for week 2, it's probably going to sound really familiar on the front end, okay? Here's what's going on. This is Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, writing. And he says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me very afraid. As I lay in bed and the fancies and the visions of my head, it says they alarmed me. So I guess you could say the dreams that he was having and the visions he was having didn't tickle his fancy, okay? Come on now, let's low hanging dad joke 101. You got to laugh at that. I said I'd cut that for this service and I didn't. So there you go. That's my blessing and gift to you today. Verse six says, So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And so, hey, I have this dream, I have these visions, I have these thoughts, I'm tossing and turning at night, I'm wondering what the heck is going on. And so all y'all, come down, tell me what's going on, and help me figure out what the deal is with this dream. So the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream but they could not make known to me its interpretation. And then watch what happens. This is different from chapter 2. 
At last Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar, that's the Babylonian name that they had given him, after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of of my dream that I saw, and tell me the interpretation. And so here's the deal. Just like chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has this crazy dream. Nobody can tell him what's going on. And he has this dilemma and this problem that he needs fixed and solved in his life. Except this time, what I want you to see is this. Rather than becoming frustrated with those around him, And rather than him wanting to kill those who were around him, he turns to Daniel and he turns to God first because he knows that they can solve this problem in his life. What's happening? Daniel's influence in the kingdom is starting to grow. Whereas he once may have been written off and not regarded, he is looked to and regarded to solve this problem in his life. Because he stood firm, because he loved well, he now looks to him as someone he can trust, someone he can rely on, and someone he can depend on to help him in his life. And so before we move any further, um, I think it's important that we stop and we ask a very important question here, okay? And I want you to think about this for your life. How have you grown in standing firm and having influence since the start of this series. I want you to think about that. So we're in chapter 4 of the book of Daniel. Daniel's influence is increasing. The impact that he's having in people's lives is growing because he's standing firm on who God wanted him to be. So we're three weeks in today. How are you standing firm and having influence more now than you were three weeks ago? And so students, how are you standing firm and having influence for Jesus more now with your classmates and with your teammates in the locker room than you were three weeks ago? Adults in your marriage, and how are you standing firm more now and having influence more now with your spouse who may not know the Lord? than you did three weeks ago. And for all of us, in our lives, in our relationships, in our careers, in our friendships, how are you standing firm and having more influence now than we were at the beginning of this series? Because hear my heart today. I'm not asking this question to beat you up. I'm asking this question to build you up, okay? The point of this series is not to just have a good Bible study and make it through the book of Daniel and get into God's Word. The point of this study is that God's word would get into you so that you can then influence the people around you in your life that God wants you to reach. Man, what does that look like for you? What does that look like for me? If it is growing, celebrate that. If it's not growing, be encouraged by that. Man, big things are happening in the kingdom of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar because he's standing firm. And listen to me, big things will happen in your life and your relationships if you will do the same. It's true for Daniel and it's true for us. Twice in this passage, Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 18 and in verse 9, Hey, I know that no problem is too great for you and your God. That's incredible for someone who didn't even believe in him before. And so from there, if you look in verses 13 through 18 of Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar actually starts to share this dream with Daniel. He's going to tell him what's going on, and he's going to ask him for his help in solving it. And I'll just summarize this for you. Maybe you can read it later. But he basically says, hey, Daniel, here's the deal, man. Okay, In this dream, I saw this huge tree. In fact, it was so huge and it was so tall that it literally reached the heavens. This thing was massive. Its leaves were so wide that it gave shade to everyone around it. Its fruit was so abundant. Like the Welch's fruit snacks were so plentiful 
that there was no hunger for anyone who was in the area, okay? Man, the fruit was so abundant. But suddenly, a man from heaven came down and he chopped down the tree, only leaving a stump. And he said he did this so that everyone would know that God is the highest God and he is the ruler over all nations. So we looked at Daniel and says, all right, buddy, lay some knowledge on me, okay? Like, tell me what in the world that means. Solve this problem, solve this dilemma in my life. And in this moment, Daniel has a decision he's got to make. Is he going to tell Nebuchadnezzar what he needs to hear and initiate truth and conflict in his life? Or is he going to tell Nebuchadnezzar what he wants to hear and compromise and not share the truth in his life? What's he going to do? How is he going to respond? And in the following verses in Daniel chapter 4, we see exactly what he did, and we see more importantly how he responded in this moment. Let's look at this together. There's a lot we can learn when we look at solving conflict in our lives. So Daniel says in chapter 4, verse 19, it says, Belteshazzar, his Babylonian name, answered Nebuchadnezzar and said, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. In other words, what Daniel is doing here before he initiates conflict is he is engaging in the relationship he has with him and he is saying that he loves him and is for him. He says, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, like this dream is not going to be good, bro. Like it's not going to be good. And may it be for your enemies. May it be for those who hate you. I love you. I care about you. I want what's best for you. That's the first thing he says. And listen to me, that is going to help you and me so much when it comes to conflict. See, a lot of times what happens when it comes to conflict is we just want to dive right into it, okay? I'm about to browbeat you with the truth and everything you have done wrong, right? I'm going to make a point. I'm going to be right. I'm going to win the argument. I'm fixing to lay it on you, baby. That's just how we are, right? But what Daniel does before he initiates conflict and before he shares the truth is he connects with him before he corrects him. He feeds into that relationship. And listen, if you'll do that, with your kids, if you'll do that with your coworkers, if you'll do that in your relationships, before you have that hard conversation, that is going to help so much, okay? Because I don't know about you, but what's true for me, like if I know that you are for me, like I really mean this, if I know that you are for me, if I know that you're not against me and that you want to help me in my life, that I'm going to listen to whatever it is you have to say to me. I may not agree with what you say to me, right? But I'm going to listen to what you have to say to me. Why? Because I know your heart. Daniel was showing his heart in this moment. And because of that, I believe it's going to open up Nebuchadnezzar to whatever it is he's going to say next as he interprets this dream for him. And so he shares his heart. He connects with him before he's about to correct him. And then and only then does Daniel share the truth with him and initiate conflict with him. Look at what he says in verse 22 in chapter 4. Talk about flipping the script. It's you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Like, hey, that tree you saw in your dream, that's you, ma'am. Like, you're the one who has grown. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. This is the interpretation, O king. So here, here's what this dream is. Now here is what this dream means. It is a decree from the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. Hey, this is from God, and he wants me to communicate this to you. That you shall be driven from among the men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. Hey, you're going to be cast out and thrown out from where you are. You shall be made to eat the grass like an ox, and you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. 
and seven periods of time, you could also translate that as seven years, seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump at the roots of the tree, they cut it down and they left a stump, just like that was commanded. Your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. And so, hey, the kingdom's going to be stripped from you. It's going to leave you. You're not going to get it back until you recognize that heaven rules the show, okay? That he's the most high God, that he's the king of kings and lord of lords and is sovereign and in control over everything in the earth. Now, that's pretty blunt and direct, right? Like, how many of you agree with that? Like, he just got straight to the point. He could have stopped there while he was ahead, okay? Like, hey man, you just asked me to interpret the dream. I interpreted the dream for you. Now I'm going to go home, sit on my couch, eat a TV dinner and watch Netflix, okay? Like, I've done my kingly duties for the day. Pack it up and go home. We're good to go, Nebby. He could have stopped there, but he didn't. Instead, he took the next step and he initiated conflict with him because he wanted to help him in his life. In fact, listen to this in verse 27. Courageous, bold moment where he made this decision. He says, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. And so there it is again. Hey, I care about you. I want what's best for you. Like, I am prioritizing my relationship with you Please accept my advice. Listen to what I am saying. And then he drops these two bombshell words on him. He says, stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. And perhaps then you will be able to prosper. In other words, as he's initiating conflict, he says, hey, Like, I love you. I want you to hear me. I want you to pick up what I'm laying down, okay? Like, you need to stop living the life that you are living because it is heading towards destruction and you losing everything. And I want you to choose the life that God has for you, which will result in blessing and Him giving you everything. Like, I want you to hear this. I want you to stop this. I want you to follow this. He initiates conflict with Him. And I just want to say, in your life and in mine, okay, That is what handling conflict in a loving way looks like. It's showing people that you love them. It's showing people that you're for them. But it's also not being afraid to share the truth which is going to help them the most in their life. This is a great example of what it looks like for us to do that. Now we can look at that and say, well, man, that's a great story. Like Daniel was so bold, I guess I should do that. But a lot of you are probably wondering more specifically, okay, well, how? Like how practically can I start doing this in relationships and in conflicts that I have within my life? And so what I want to do for the next 10 to 15 minutes I have with you is I want to just put some tools on your tool belt that's going to help you and help me start doing this very, very well. And I want to do that by taking you to one verse in the New Testament in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. I want to read this for you. This is written by Paul, who was a follower of Jesus. And he said this, and look, it's just my prayer for you today, that if you have conflict in your life right now, or you have conflict in your future, that this verse would be a prayer for you before you step into that. Look at what Paul says. He says, brothers and sisters, so you're like, all of us, if someone is caught in a sin, what did Daniel say to Nebuchadnezzar? He said, stop. Was it a decaf crowd? What do you, come on, what did he say? He said, stop. He did, he said, stop sinning. So if someone's caught in a sin, well, we've all done that. We've all been there before. Nobody's perfect. If someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that lives in you as a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, you should restore that person, what's he say? 
gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. And so for me, I'll be honest, okay? Uh, Many times in my life, I find myself confronting people because I want to be right, okay? I'm just going to be real with you. How many of you are there? You're like, yeah, I just want to make my point. I want to get my agenda across. I want to win the argument. Yeah. Many times if I confront someone and I'm not healthy and my heart's in the wrong place, I enter into that argument because I want to be right. But listen, I've had to learn the hard way that that's not the best way. It's really not. We're not in this thing to win arguments. We're not in this thing to be right. We're in this thing to win people and so that people can be in a relationship with God which can make them right. Paul says if someone is caught in a sin, we should restore them gently. And you know what Paul's actually saying, if I can boil it down to just a few words? The goal of conflict is restoration. The goal of conflict is not condemnation. Hey, if you're caught in a sin, if your friend's caught in a sin, if your kid's caught in a sin, if someone's messed up and we want to have that conversation and initiate conflict with them in a loving way, the goal should always be to restore that person. And to bring them back to health. And spiritual health, emotional health, mental health, physical health. It's to lead them in a direction that is going to add value to their lives and help them live the right way that God wants them to live. It's not to beat them down and judge them and condemn them and make, they feel, make them feel worse than they already feel because of what they did, right? I know when I screw up, I don't need to be reminded, Right? The goal is restoration. It is not condemnation. And I I just want you to think about that for your life and your family and your career and your relationships. How different would the conflict you enter in be if you started it by wanting to restore them gently? Well, man, you messed up. Can't believe you did that. Man, you're a failure. You're a has-been. You're never going to recover from this. Man, how dare you do that? That's condemnation. How much different would it be if you went for restoration? To say, hey, hey, look, you messed up. We all mess up. I've messed up. God loves you. God's not done with you. God forgives you. And I'm here to help you in this situation. Think of how different that would be for you and me and the people God wants us to influence. It is what Daniel is doing in this moment. It is what we should do. And if we're wondering where to start, just pray that. God, I'm fixing to have a hard conversation. God, help me to be gentle. Help my goal to be to restore this person, not condemn this person. Help my goal be to build this person up, not tear this person down. Help my goal be to make a difference and not a point. If you'll do that and I'll do that, listen, conflict is going to go a whole lot different. It's true for you and me, and it's also true in the life of Daniel. That's exactly what he did. King, I love you. King, I want what's best for you. King, I value your life and your relationship. And so please, stop doing this. Stop sinning. Stop wrecking your life. Stop making wrong choices. And start making the right choices by God's power and grace. It's exactly what Daniel is doing. And listen to me. I know in a room like this that a lot of times when it comes to conflict and talking about sin and all that junk, that a lot of us are very hesitant. I get it. We don't want to offend people. We don't want to trip people up. We don't want to Bible thump anybody. (laughs) But what I've realized in a decade of ministry is what people need most in their lives is the truth. Because the truth is what is going to be most helpful for them in their lives in that moment. I mean, what did Daniel say? He said, hey, 
do the right thing, follow the Lord, honor the Lord, and you will prosper. And God knows what's best for us. He's not out to get us or be a buzzkill. And I find if we will share that with people, if we'll believe that ourselves, it helps us engage in conflict well, and it helps us be gentle when we engage in conflict with other people. And so what does Nebuchadnezzar do? So Daniel initiates conflict. He stands firm. He shares the truth in a loving way. How does Nebuchadnezzar respond in this moment? Does he go, oh, Daniel, you're so right, man. Like, why didn't I recognize this sooner? If you would have been here five minutes ago, I wouldn't have made all these mistakes, right? Does he grab his kazoo and gather around the campfire with them and they just sing Kumbaya and they have a great time together, right? They pull up their favorite Spotify playlist and just start jamming together and having a good old time. Like, what, what, what does Nebuchadnezzar do? And the sad thing is he didn't do any of that. The sad thing is he didn't listen to Daniel. More importantly, he didn't listen to God. And because of that, this dream that he had became a reality in his life. And I just want to say this. Some of you are here today or you're watching online. And you're going to follow what God's calling you to do to initiate conflict. You're going to connect with people before you correct them. And you're going to speak the truth of God's Word into their life. You're going to be faithful to do that. And some people aren't going to listen. They're going to keep doing their own thing. They're going to keep living their own way. And in that moment, what the enemy wants to do is to discourage you because you actually stood up and did something. And what I want to tell you is this. It's true in this situation, and it's also true in your life. Guys, you are responsible to people, but you know what? You are not responsible for people. And I want you to receive that today. God calls you to be responsible to people in sharing your faith, in your career, in your family, in your relationships. He calls you to be responsible to them to share those things. But listen to me, you can't be responsible for what they do and how they respond. You cannot control what people do and how they respond to what you share with them. You can control what you do and how God calls you to respond in sharing the truth with them. You are responsible to people, but you can't put that guilt on yourself to be responsible for them. If you've been faithful to share what God has laid on your heart, then you've done all you can do. The rest is up to them and the rest is up to the Lord. But don't let their reaction scare you from taking the right reaction of sharing your faith with them, because that's what God wants you to do. Here's the thing. That's what Daniel did in this moment. Daniel shared the truth of God's Word, and Nebuchadnezzar went off and did his own thing, right? He walked away from the Lord. His kingdom was stripped away from him. He was out in the field eating grass. The dew was covering him. People were mocking him. Everybody was making fun of him. It seemed like what Daniel had done and said was not taking root until something amazing happens at the end of the story. You remember how long the dream said that Nebuchadnezzar would have to wait until his kingdom was restored to him? Seven years. What's amazing is at the end of this chapter... Nebuchadnezzar is writing, and he says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, watch this. Remember, that that seed had been planted. The truth had been shared. Loving conflict had been initiated. And seven years later, I lifted my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all His works are right and all of His ways are just. And those who walk in pride, He is able to humble. And I'm praying for some of you here today that you would have a Nebuchadnezzar-type moment in your faith. 
that you would realize that you have been running away from God. You've been hiding from God. You've been trying to get away from God. But today could be a day where your reason returns to you, where you realize that he loves you. You realize that his people love you. You realize that he wants to restore you and not condemn you for the mistakes that you've made in your life. Though it didn't seem like it took root at first, seven years later, it took root. And one of the most wicked rulers who has ever lived in the history of the world now places his faith and trust and gives honor and praise to God in his life. And I know that he can do the same for you. He can do the same for that family member you've been praying for for years that doesn't know Jesus. And he can do the same for the people that God has in your life that he wants you to reach and he wants you to to influence. But it starts with us being willing to stand firm. And it starts with us being willing to have influence. To share the truth, but to do it in love. To be honest, but to honor the relationship. Man, if you will try that this week, if you'll do that this week, it may not be tomorrow. It may not be three years from now. But God's word says it does not return void. And if you plant that seed, I know in God's way and in God's timing that can come to fruition. And that conflict can be resolved. That relationship can be restored. And that purpose can be accessed because we did what God wanted us to do and lived the life that God wanted us to live. And so as we seek to do that this week, Let me throw three things your way just to summarize what we've looked at and see how God wants to change us. So look, as we look at conflict this week, I'm not saying you have to go looking for conflict, okay? Don't go trying to pick a fight with someone after service in the parking lot, right? That's not what this is about. We're here for people, not to win arguments. But if conflict happens or there's a conversation that needs to be had, Start by showing people that you are for them, okay? Guys, I am passionate about this right here. For far too long, the church has been known for what it is against rather than what it is for. People know what the church is supposedly against. People know what they don't want to be a part of. What they don't know is what we're here for and who we're here for. And we're here for people. No matter who you are, where you're from, what mistakes you've made. If conflict happens, share your heart with them. You love them and want what's best for them, and God does too. And because of that, we may have an uncomfortable conversation, but my goal is to restore you and not condemn you. Second, look, speak God's truth over them, okay? Look, you need to show you're for them, but if we don't get to the truth and what's going to most help their life, then we're almost missing the mark. What they need is God. What they need is God's word. What they need is God's plan. What they need is God's purpose. Man, speak that truth into their life and watch and be amazed at what God does in that moment. And then lastly, look, trust God with the results, okay? You've got to trust him. You're responsible to people, but you cannot be responsible for them. Man, trust him that he is faithful, Trust him that he will work in his plan and his time. And trust him that like Nebuchadnezzar, faith can be born and inspired and followed. Because a group of people said, hey, I'm going to share the truth and initiate conflict if needed. But I'm going to do so in a loving way that builds you up and doesn't tear you down. So what I want to do before... My friend Alan comes and wraps us up with some closing comments and next steps is I actually want to pray for us today. I want to pray that God would work in your heart and life and in the hearts and lives of people around you so that we can live this out and be transformed by God's word, not just informed by it. And so I just want to ask that all of you bow your heads and close your eyes if you're comfortable with that. And I just want to enter into a spirit of prayer. Father, I come before you today and I thank you. 
for the life of Daniel. I thank you for the example that he gives us. And I thank you for this word that you've shared with us today. Father, I just want to pray for two different groups of people in the room right now. And the first group of people I want to pray for are those who may be in conflict right now or they have conflict that's coming in the future. Let me just ask you here today, no one's looking at you but me, but if you're in a season of life right now where there's conflict that you're in, where you're just needing God to show up, or if there's a conversation that needs to be had that you need God's help with, Maybe it's a difficult person, friend, family member, co-worker. Would you raise your hand for me? I would just love to pray for you and your life and your situations. Man, thank you all for your honesty. Thank you all for raising your hands. God, I pray for this group of people. Father, Jesus Christ said that as followers of Jesus, we should be as wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. I pray that over them today. Ephesians 4.15 says that we should speak the truth in love. And I pray that over them today. God, your word says if someone is caught in a sin, that we should restore them gently. I pray that over them today. Help them to connect before they correct. Help them to win people and not arguments. And help them to not make a point, but to make a difference in people's lives this week. Father, I just felt led to pray for the people who may be on the other end of that conversation. Give them open hearts. Give them open minds. And God, please just help them believe that you know what's best for them. Father, the second group of people I want to pray for here today are people who may not know Jesus. Maybe they're like Nebuchadnezzar and they've been running away from you for a long, long time. And I pray your word over them right now. I pray that today would be a day where their reason returns to them, where your Holy Spirit would open their eyes to see you and ears to hear you and a heart and life to fill you and welcome you in. And that like Nebuchadnezzar, today could be the day where they place their faith in you and they praise and honor you and where they follow you with their lives and trust you with everything they have. If you're here today and you're wanting to begin that relationship with Jesus, you realize you've been running away from God, but God's been running after you because he loves you. Would you raise your hand if you're wanting to take that step today? I'd just love to pray for you and your life and your situation. Father, I pray for these people. I pray that they would know following Jesus is the best decision they could ever make with their lives. I pray they would know they can trust you because you're trustworthy and that you love them so much. Someone's wanting to take that step today. I pray they would say something like this to you wherever they're at. Just tell them, say, God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the life that he lived. Thank you for the death that he died. I believe in Jesus. Help me to follow Jesus. And help me to honor Jesus in everything I do. you prayed something like that, I just want to encourage you. When you walked in the room, you got a connect card. Grab that right now. No one's looking at you. Fill it out and check that box at the bottom that says, I became a follower of Jesus today. We want to follow up with you and help you in your new faith journey. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. And we would love to help you however we can. Father, for all of us, transform us by your word today. 
grow our influence today. Help us to stand firm today so that we can love the people you want us to love and we can reach the people that you want us to reach. And I ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.